Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Carol Gifford, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's webinar. Um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, tonight's presentation, um, as you know, will be given by Dr. Timothy Detmer, who is a board certified ENT physician and surgeon at Mercy One North Iowa ENT specialty at the Mason City Clinic. And Dr. Detmer will be talking about obstructive sleep apnea and a procedure he performs called upper airway stimulation that is bringing great relief to his patients for their sleep apnea symptoms. So the presentation will be approximately 15 minutes and then Dr. Detmer will be happy to answer any of your questions. So please type your questions into the chat box at the bottom of your um, window. And then, you know, during the presentation or right after, and then he will get to as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Um, and as was noted at the beginning, uh, we are recording this uh, presentation and um, uh, look forward to hearing from Dr. Detmer. So without further ado, um, take it away. Thank you, Carol. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, I think we'll have probably a good turnout tonight, thanks to the, the dreary weather, weather we've been having today, although I see the sun is finally coming out. First time we've seen that in a while. Um, as Carol said, I'm one of the ear, nose, and throat uh, doctors at the Mason City Clinic, and I've been here almost 17 years already. Time has really flown. Um, and what I'm going to talk about tonight is this upper airway stimulation therapy. And uh, some of you might be saying, well, what is that? I thought this was about maybe the Inspire implant, and I just wanted to kind of clarify some of the language right away that um, upper airway stimulation is a kind of therapy that we do for obstructive sleep apnea that helps um, open the airway essentially when people are sleeping. And what I'm gonna talk about tonight is a specific uh, procedure we do for that that is actually, it's called a hypoglossal nerve stimulator implant. And so it's an implant that stimulates the nerve to the tongue muscles that allows the tongue to move out of the way while people are sleeping. And right now, the only company that makes the hypoglossal nerve stimulator implant is the Inspire uh, company. And so we call it the Inspire implant. And, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, commercials on TV. It's really out there now, um, radio commercials, other things for the Inspire implant. But um, we're kind of bound by some rules and regulations. And so I can't use the term Inspire implant during the procedure. And so I'll be calling it upper airway stimulation or a hypoglossal nerve stimulator implant. But they all kind of talk about the same thing that you've heard of. Um, on those television commercials. So I hope that clears that up right away. Um, but I've been here for 17 years and for the last three years, we've been doing this procedure. We've been having an excellent um, response for patients and it's been a wonderful addition to our practice. And so I'm glad you're here to learn a little bit about it. At the end, I can answer questions like Carol said. <clears throat> this is just a disclosure saying that I have no, I don't get any financial benefit for giving this talk. I don't own any shares in the Inspire Implant Company or anything like that. So first I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what is obstructive sleep apnea, just as a, a quick introduction. And um, essentially uh, obstructive sleep apnea is obstruction of the airway when people are sleeping. And it's kind of in a continuum with snoring. Snoring is when the airway collapses and it starts making that nasty, loud, vibrating noise that keeps your bed partners awake. And then eventually, um, as it progresses, sometimes the airway collapses so much that people actually stop breathing throughout the, throughout the nighttime, multiple times per night. And um, usually it's caused by collapse in the back of the throat area, like the tongue and the soft palate, that uvula, the dangly thing, um, the side walls of the throat, all that tissue kind of collapses. And it, it's extremely common. Um, and as people get older, it gets more common as well, just because as we get older, we tend to um, gain weight and it kind of makes our airways more narrow. And also um, we lose the elasticity of our tissues and the tissue collapses more. So we see it, see it very common. Um, a, a lot of people are undiagnosed with sleep apnea and sleep apnea is kind of a new disease. And it's been around of course, since the beginning of mankind, but it's only new in that we, we are only starting to understand it better in the last few decades. And we're really starting to understand how it affects the whole body in a negative way. And it's quite a significant medical problem. Now, this on the bottom, that box that popped up, this is a tracing um, of uh, the breathing of a person with sleep apnea, essentially. And so when people have sleep apnea, we diagnose it with a sleep study. And during sleep study, they'll measure oxygen levels in the blood. Normally, your oxygen should be above 90%. 
But when people stop breathing uh, for several seconds, their oxygen will drop. And this happens repetitively throughout the nighttime. And so this is an example of when somebody stops breathing for 47 seconds, then all the way up to 86 seconds. Can you, and that, that's not uncommon. Imagine holding your breath for that long right now. And that happens to people routinely at nighttime when they do have sleep apnea, the oxygen can really drop. And that's called hypoxia when the oxygen drops that low. And we're, the, the hypoxia is kind of what we're learning about how that can really affect uh, a person's overall health. It can lead to increased buildup of plaques and arteries, which can lead to increased risk of heart attacks and strokes and other medical problems. So there are several consequences, of course, of untreated sleep apnea. I'm sure many of you are aware of most of these. Um, of course, it can lead to decreased fatigue, or sorry, increased fatigue and decreased productivity. People often just feel tired throughout the daytime. They have a lack of energy. They can sleep many hours during the night, but not feel refreshed when they wake up. Um, we know that it increases risk of accidents while driving, and a lot of professional drivers um, need to be uh, evaluated and treated for sleep apnea. Their, their, uh, uh, their companies require that of them. And uh, of course, it affects bed partners. We know that. And then on the far, the far um, right side, you'll see that uh, it can lead to increased vascular disease and increased risk of heart attack and stroke, um, as well as high blood pressure and cardiac arrhythmias. And so it is a medical problem. And when we get sleep studies, we, we can see how significant a sleep apnea is and, and graded on a scale of mild, moderate, or severe. And the moderate to severe sleep apnea is really the type of sleep apnea that's, uh, that puts people at risk of medical comorbidities, we call that, like increased risk of heart attack and stroke and other issues. So I was gonna talk a little bit now about uh, treatment of sleep apnea. And of course, um, the first line therapy, especially for moderate to severe uh, sleep apnea that's more concerning is positive pressure machines, otherwise known as CPAP machines. And nowadays we even have smarter ones called autopap machines that kind of change the pressure with each breath to keep the airway open. And um, that's first line therapy and it works great for people. Um, a lot of people, it, it uh, comes with the machine and a hose and a mask. It essentially provides a pneumatic splint to the airway so that that soft tissue, those structures in the airway can't collapse. It kind of stents them open. Um, but the, the problem with the uh, CPAP that we, that we know about is a lot of people just can't tolerate it very well um, and it ends up in the closet. And there's a variety of reasons for that. You know, people can have claustrophobia. Some people can't stand the, the pressure or the masks leak, no matter what mask they try. Some people throw it off in the middle of the night without even knowing it. You know, they just wake up and it's on their bedroom floor. And so a lot of times it ends up in the closet then. And, um, and so some people are very fortunate. They can they can take to it like a duck does to water, but then a lot of times it can be uh, frustrating. Now, for those people who struggle with their positive pressure machines, there's other options too. And so like an oral appliance here um, can be a good option for people with snoring and sleep apnea, but it does have its limitations. Uh, first of all, it's, it's really more helpful for mild sleep apnea. When people get into moderate severe sleep apnea, it doesn't always work quite as well at opening the airway significantly. Also, they're not always covered well by insurance, can be a little expensive. Um, and uh, they're made by dentists. A lot of dental offices are very good at treating sleep apnea with these devices. And so they are a good option for mild sleep apnea. And then on the right side, there's even anatomy altering surgeries. And those are pretty rarely needed. But there are some people who um, are kind of built with a recessed jaw, a recessed cheekbones that causes airway uh, pinching in the back of the throat. And so there are some surgeries to expand the airway, but those are those have limitations and most people really aren't good candidates for those. Um, there are some surgeries we used to do regularly. You know, I've been at this long enough that when I was in training uh, 18, 20 years ago, anybody who came in with sleep apnea, we signed them up for the uvulopaudal pharyngoplasty, which is a mouthful, but that's essentially where we go in and take out the tonsils and trim off the uvula and try and create an arch in the back of the throat. And, and uh, we did that to everybody and it seemed to work for a couple of years, but then people's sleep apnea tended to come back. And so now we know that it just doesn't have lasting benefits. So there's a lot of surgeries and procedures that I've seen come and go over the years because it just didn't provide lasting benefit. So that kind of brings us, let me see if I, oh, I thought I skipped a slide. That brings us to upper airway stimulation. And then this is a procedure that, um, like I said, we've been doing for about three years. This is a procedure, uh, the Inspire implant uh, was actually 
um, FDA approved back in 2014. And so it's been around for several years now. Um, at first, didn't really hear about it too much because it was being done at a few academic centers. But then some studies came out from the initial uh, patients who had it done showing that it was really working well and it had lasting benefit. And so uh, now it's starting to gain traction. It's being performed at more and more medical centers. We're proud in Mason City to be one of the first medical centers to perform it uh, in the area. And we've been doing it now for over three years and, done, and have a good uh, experience here locally um, with patients. And so um, this is a, a, a neat and exciting procedure because it does fill a gap in healthcare that previously um, we didn't have much to offer. Uh, this is for people who are struggling with their CPAP machines and have significant sleep apnea and were previously going untreated. And so this really provides a new option for people. And um, it is a surgical procedure that we do uh, to place this implant. Essentially, um, we make two small incisions when we insert the implant. And one is uh, up in the neck and one is down in the chest here. It's done on the right side. And this diagram kind of shows where the implant is in the body. Um, essentially, you can see uh, where there's a stimulation cuff on that diagram. That's a little cuff that we put around a nerve to the tongue muscle. And, and then down in the chest, there's a battery device and a small breathing sensor that goes between the ribs. And the way this thing functions is that once it's inserted and, and um, people start utilizing that they turn it on with the remote control here on the chest over the battery at nighttime. And it begins to function so that when people fall asleep, it gives us a, a slight stimulation to the nerve that goes to the tongue. And it causes the tongue to move forward and out of the way so that it doesn't collapse the, the airway in the back of the throat. And, um, and that allows people to breathe better so that they don't have the obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, it's an outpatient surgery that takes about two hours to perform. The recovery is really quick. And so we've done well over a hundred of these and I have yet to have anybody come back with any major complications from the surgery. Um, have anybody yet to come back and say that the device is interfering with any of the daily activities. And so it, it really um, is a, a simple surgery actually and a, a quick recovery and it doesn't seem to negatively affect people afterwards. Um, the battery life, as you can see on this slide for that battery implant is about 11 years. The battery is kind of like a pacemaker battery that people get for uh, cardiac arrhythmias, um, except that pacemakers are on the left side of the chest, but this is done on the right side of the chest. But the battery life for that is about 11 years. The biggest drawback I, I, I would tell people of having this implant over time is that there are significant uh, MRI restrictions. And so MRIs are big magnetic uh, imaging machines and it's a no-no, unfortunately, you get an MRI of the torso after the surgery. MRIs can still be done on the head and the neck and the extremities, but there are some restrictions to that as well. And so when we do this surgery, we give people an implant card, which is pretty typical for anybody who has a surgical implant and they, people keep that in their wallet. And when they go to airports, they can show the, the, uh, the people there what's, what's showing up on the x-ray in their body. But then also on the other side, it has those MRI restrictions. So people can refer to that if they have to get an imaging study in the future. But that's probably the biggest uh, long-term problem is that there are some significant MRI restrictions. Usually we can work around that and get other types of imaging studies though. Um, so the, the, uh, when we do this um, upper airway stimulation surgery procedure, um, people go home, it's a same day surgery. We have them come back for one week for a follow-up to make sure things are healing well and that it looks good. And then about six weeks later, we have people follow up again with Dr. Uh, Phil Lee, he's our sleep medicine provider, and he helps with um, activating the device. And so there's a six week period of time where it has to heal before people can use it. And, um, and uh, that's kind of a little bit frustrating, but it's, it's important to allow the device to heal in um, into place before it's turned on. And then people start to use it at home and uh, learn. And Dr. Lee teaches people how to uh, adjust the settings on it. So it can be programmed a little bit to provide different um, rates of stimulation. And then about 12 weeks after surgery, about three months after surgery, we recommend a sleep study, which is actually really helpful and beneficial. So during that sleep study, there's a technician who's trained with the implant at changing the settings, and we can try and optimize the settings, make sure that it's working well for patients. So that's kind of how we follow up with patients uh, after surgery in the short, in the short term. Now, this is kind of a busy slide, but it has some important um, uh, graphs. This is kind of the meat 
guess you could say the presentation too, where it talks a lot about the, the outcomes. Um, that's the most important part of it, right? Is knowing if does it work or not. And um, what I can tell you is, yes, we've been extremely happy with this and there's nothing better at this point on the market than or any other options other than this upper airway stimulation therapy. And so what we've been seeing in our, th these slides are from our own personal experience. And they're, we're actually proud that these are better than the national guidelines and the published data from back in 2018 um, when Inspire Implant was kind of first heard of with the first initial reports. And so what we're seeing is on average with our patients, we've been seeing about a 90, 88 to 90% reduction in the apnea hypopnea index from before and after surgery. And so on a sleep study, the apnea hypopnea index is the single most important number that you see on a sleep study. It's the number of times per hour when a person stops breathing. And on average, with after surgery, seeing a 90% reduction in that approximately. And so that means that we're bringing people from the moderate to severe level down into the normal range or the very low mild range. And when that happens, people improve significantly with decreased symptoms. They feel refreshed in the daytime. Um, they have better energy level. And we get them out of that risky area of moderate to severe sleep apnea that can cause medical comorbidities. And as a result of that, we're seeing about 94% patient satisfaction. And so we're really proud of that, that 94% patients are, are, are extremely happy with it and feel that it improves their quality of life and uh, in the long run should improve uh, any medical problems that they would otherwise have if they were untreated. Um, that, last, uh, that last graph on the right side, that bar graph, shows that on, on average, people are using it seven hours per night, which is essentially all night long. And that's all our patients we've done on average are using it seven hours a night. So that tells you that when, when we put these implants in, people are using it. Um, the utilization is, is just way higher than CPAP util, utilization. As we know, a lot of people struggle with CPAP and can't use it. The required four hours a night. And we are just seeing excellent usage with this uh, implant that we've been doing. And the other awesome thing is, um, is that we're seeing lasting benefits. So a lot of the studies that have come out show that um, over, over five years, when people have had this implant um, in other institutions, they're still getting benefit like this. And so that's different than some of those other surgeries I talked about before that would provide benefit for maybe a few years, but then things would start to get worse again. We're not seeing what, that with the implant. This is kind of a novel new treatment that stimulates this nerve to the tongue and it continues to work. It continues to open the airway over time. And so we think it's gonna provide lasting benefit. And that's what's so exciting is that we're getting excellent results and it, it seems to be long lasting results too. So something new and unique compared to other things that have come and gone. Um, this is a slide that um, kind of talks about insurance coverage. Initially, when this came out three years ago, we really had to battle with insurance companies because it was new and considered experimental. And this slide is almost becoming obsolete because we're, we're not seeing as much difficulty anymore. And the insurance companies are really developing what we call um, positive policies on, on the implant, which means that they will support it as long as people meet the criteria for it. Um, so it hasn't been such an issue and we, we don't run into too much trouble now with getting insurance coverage. They do tend to cover it quite well for the most part, as long as people meet criteria for it. And that'll bring us to the next slide here. This is, here it is. This slide um, kind of talks about some of the criteria. So this is another important slide. Um, unfortunately, the upper airway stimulation therapy, that hypoglossal nerve stimulator implant or Inspire implant has some um, requirements for people to be a candidate. First of all, uh, people have to have moderate to severe sleep apnea. That's the, that's the concerning level of sleep apnea. People with mild sleep apnea, that's not quite as dangerous. Really, there's no re reason to do this surgical implant for them. And the sleep study has to be less than two years old. So sometimes when people come in for initial consultation, one of the first things we have to do is update their sleep study, order another sleep study so we can um, see that they do have that moderate to severe sleep, sleep apnea if their sleep study is longer than, uh, or is older than two years. The other thing is people have to try CPAP first. And so this is not first line therapy. It's not meant to really replace CPAP because CPAP still has benefit for most people who, who use it, but there are significant uh, portion of patients who struggle with the CPAP. And if, if people have used it and just can't get benefit, then we can talk more about the, the implant. Um, there is a BMI limit, which is, means that people cannot be significantly overweight. People can be over, overweight, but not uh, morbidly obese. And so there is a BMI limit, which is the body mass index that we calculate. It's based on height and weight, and it actually is different depending on the insurance company. For example, Medicare patients, the BMI has to be less than 35, 
Whereas a lot of the private insurances, it's down to 32. The BMI has to be less than 32. And that can be kind of frustrating. And sometimes uh, we have to work on weight loss with patients before we can actually um, go ahead with the implant. But there, there are some requirements there. And then the airway exam is something that we do um, under light sedation where we um, do it. When we do the, uh, the Inspire implant, that, that uh, implant, it's actually a two-step process where first we bring people in and we do a, an airway exam under light anesthesia to make sure the tongue is actually falling back and collapsing the airway. And about 95% of people have that problem when they have sleep apnea. Um, but there's about 5% of people where the sidewalls of the throat might collapse in this way. And, and, and unfortunately, the Inspire implant may not help those people quite as much. And so um, we do have to do that airway exam too to um, make sure that we're in, implanting people appropriately. And then once people meet all those criteria, then we can schedule the implant and go on uh, with that surgery that we had, had mentioned earlier. Um, I think that's about all I have for the information part of this. There's information here as far as um, if you're interested to make a, a, a consultation with us or a visit with us, and you can so, certainly do that as a self-referral. You don't need to be sent by any physicians. You can do it um, by calling our office at this phone number. You can do it, I think, on, on the um, uh, website, on our website. Uh, we do actually have outreach clinics we go to as well, so we can try and see people in their communities or closer to their homes. Um, don't have to drive all, always, uh, all the way to Mason City every time. Um, so I think that's pretty much what I have for the information part of this. And hopefully uh, you learned something about the hypoglossal nerve stimulator implant and upper airway stimulation therapy. Um, I'd open up to questions now. Uh, Dr. Detmer, I see a few that have come in throughout the presentation. Um, Tim is asking, can he swim with the implant and how is the battery replaced? That's a good question. Yes, the, you, the, there aren't really any restrictions for activities after the implant. Um, the implant is uh, um, underneath the skin in the, uh, up here in the chin area. And then there's a little wire that goes underneath the skin um, down to the chest area. And the only thing you can feel afterwards would be the, the little battery on the chest wall here. There's a slight, there's a slight bump in the chest wall there, kind of like a pacemaker battery. And I don't know if I mentioned that. That's the only part afterwards that you would be able to, to feel a little bit there. But the rest of it's all deeper underneath the tissue where you can't feel it or see it. And, and so it's covered with tissue and you can do normal activities. Um, we've had people implanted from 30 years old up into their 80s. We've done a, a, a quite a, a age range, all different activities and um, uh, and hobbies, you know, that people have had this done. And I haven't had anybody come back yet and say this is, you know, messed up their golf game or or their swimming or anything like that. So really, um, doesn't seem to bother people much. It just kind of sits there and people get used to it. Um, and so uh, you certainly can be underwater, no problem with that at all. And then the other question was, uh, how has the battery changed? We haven't had to change any batteries yet since we've only been doing this three years and the battery life is 11 years, but um, we can make a simple incision under a local anesthetic over the battery and then switch it out for a new battery, um, which would not be hard to do. I have done over a hundred of these and I had two patients where the, the battery here that we call it implantable pulse generator, but the generator battery um, started to wander a little bit. We, we suture it in and secure it during surgery and then the body forms a capsule around it. And there's a slight chance that it could move or, or not, um, or flip over a little bit in the chest wall, extremely unlikely. But for those two patients, um, we, we did kind of a similar thing as a battery exchange where we made a little incision there under local anesthetic, went in and fixed the battery. And then those people did fine. And, um, and just so you know, since then, we've actually changed the way we anchor the, uh, the battery in the initial surgery. So we haven't seen that be a problem since then. But that, that just showed me that it's a pretty simple procedure to go in and change the battery out under local anesthetic. Um, I have three questions that just came in. Uh, the first is from uh, Dwight, who's asking, uh, their insurance has a high deductible. Can you give a cost estimate? I know the cost is, is extreme, just like with anything else in medicine, it's a surgery. And so um, your deductible, you would, I'm sure you'd meet that, that, that year that you'd have it done, no doubt about that. Um, but the cost I know uh, would be in the tens of thousands of dollars. So that's kind of typical for um, surgeries now. 
And this one's no different than those. So it's, it's, a, it's an expense, no doubt about it, for which you would meet your deductible. And is the procedure covered by Medicare? Medicare is excellent to work with. Um, they have a positive policy for it. That means that they will cover it as long as people meet those criteria that we went through, like the, the BMI has to be less than 35. People have to have moderate to severe sleep apnea and a current sleep stay less than two years old. Um, people have to try CPAP first, and then we have to show that you've done that and failed it. But once those criteria are met, we have no problem at all with Medicare. And, um, and another good company to work with is the Walmart Blue Cross Blue Shield. So between Medicare and Wellmark, those are kind of the two biggest um, insurance providers we have in the area. So that's been really good. And then a lot of the other ones too uh, are excellent. We still once in a while have to uh, battle insurance companies for some of the companies that maybe don't have a positive policy statement written on the implant, but we can generally get through that as long as we show that people meet criteria for it. Uh, Marilyn is asking, how long is the process from first appointment to surgery and activation? That's a good question too. So when we see people for a consultation um, and if people meet all the, the criteria um, and we don't have to get another sleep study, for example, we can schedule people for that airway exam under anesthesia is the first thing we do. And that's a quick 15 minute procedure that doesn't take long to get arranged and scheduled. And we're, we're trying to um, actually streamline things. That's a good question because we're trying to streamline things um, uh, currently where we schedule the actual implant surgery the same time we schedule that airway exam surgery so we can try and get things more um, back to back. And so um, it could be that we would uh, see people and then a week or two later be able to do the airway exam procedure and then maybe uh, two to three to four weeks after that do the implant. There's a little bit of a time in there so that we can make sure that people have time if they need to to see their doctors, make sure they're okay for a longer general anesthetic, things like that. So it could be um, about uh, four to six weeks, I suppose, from the time you're initially seen to the to time you get your implant. Um, and then after the implants, about six weeks before it can be activated. So it, um, there, there are several weeks where it has to heal after surgery. And, and that always changes a little bit. Right now, we're busier than we've ever been after COVID. It's just gotten nuts. But sometimes we're not so, quite so busy, and we can even get things in a little quicker than that. So um, that's, we're trying to streamline things because we've been so busy here lately, and there has been some longer wait, wait times before the implants. Um, I have uh, two questions from uh, Cynthia. She says, uh, what if you don't have obstructive sleep apnea, but just don't breathe well, very shallow? I don't know if that's... Well, that's, that's a good question too. There's, yeah. there's a lot of different sleep disorders out there. And I don't know if I can answer a lot about some of those other ones because um, I'm not well versed in all the sleep disorders. In ENT, we kind of focus more on obstructive sleep apnea because it's an airway problem and we're... That's kind of our area of expertise, I guess you could say, is the airway and it's an airway collapse problem. Um, and so like obstructive sleep apnea is an airway collapse problem that we're, we can treat by modifying the airway, including with this upper airway stimulation implant. But it, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be a candidate or it, the upper airway stimulation is only for people with obstructive sleep apnea documented on a sleep study, I would tell you that, I guess. Um, the shallow breathing could be a different problem and might need some different intervention or workup for that. Right. Um, I have a comment from Terry. She said, I, or he, he or she, I'm not sure. I have used a CPAP for two and a half years. I do use it every night, but awake numerous times throughout the night and really do not like wearing it. Would I qualify? I think uh, that that's a good question too, because there's, there's kind of a gray area there. And sometimes it's real simple. Like people try the thing and they're claustrophobic and they can't stand it and they can't use it at all. And, and there's no way they're ever going to use it. And then that's pretty easy decision. Then some people love using their CPAP every night and they feel refreshed in the daytime, but maybe they just don't like taking it on trips and it's kind of a nuisance. And so those people, we, we actually steer away from upper airway stimulation. We, we recommend they keep using their, their CPAP, but then there's kind of the in-between and that sounds like an in-between case where, um, we have to sort of sit down and talk about it. And the upper airway stimulation is for people who do not get successful treatment with their CPAP machine. And so if, if a person feels like they can use it, but they, they wake up a lot and they have trouble getting to sleep and their, their sleep quality is worse, or they um, don't feel like they're refreshed in the daytime because maybe they just don't sleep real well with the CPAP, even though they can tolerate it, 
you could that could potentially be considered CPAP failure. And um, and so we'd have to kind of sit down and talk about it, see if the if the upper airway stimulation surgery would be a better option. Um, I, I and and so some people do okay with their CPAP, and then you have to kind of decide: is it worth going through this surgery for this implant? Um, you know, and and having that as an option, or it would be better to stay with the CPAP, and and uh, we can certainly sit down and talk about it. Um, I have a question. Uh, what if I have a dislocated clavicle on the right side? Would that be an issue with implanting the device? No, that should not be a problem. Uh, the clavicle is not um, in the way. The little, we, do, we do tunnel a little wire. It sounds kind of brutal. <laughs> and during surgery, maybe too much than you want to know, but during surgery, we have a, a small tunneling device where we tunnel the wire underneath the muscle, this muscle in the neck that you can flex here. It's called the platysma muscle. We tunnel the wire underneath there and over the clavicle down to the battery thing here. But after surgery and people wake up and go home, generally cannot feel the wire. Sometimes it might be a little tight along there for a while after surgery where it's, where it's kind of healing, but over time it loosens up and people can't really feel the wire there. But anyway, it does go over the clavicle or the collarbone, but having a dislocated um, clavicle would not be a problem. Um, I have a question from Craig. Is there a possibility of affecting a person's singing voice? No, this one, um, that sounds like a discussion when we do thyroidectomies, but when we do uh, upper airway stimulation implants, we're not anywhere near the, the nerves to the voice box. The only thing I would tell you is that it's a two hour surgery with a breathing tube, an endotracheal tube, and people are hoarse afterwards. Uh, temporarily from maybe some edema or swelling of the vocal cords, which would be typical of any surgery um, that would require a breathing tube like that. But in this particular surgery, we're not near any structures or nerves that, um, that go to the voice box. Um, I have a question from Deborah. How are the AHIs or effectiveness for an individual determined after the procedure? Well, the AHI, the apnea hypopnea index, is the most important number on the sleep study, like I mentioned, and that's the number of times per hour on average where a person does stop breathing. And so, um, um, it, it, we and there, there's a scale based on that number of whether a person has mild, moderate, severe sleep apnea. And so, for Inspire implantation, um, the criteria is your AHI has to be between 15 and 65. That's the moderate to severe range, and then after surgery, we, we generally recommend and, and the vast majority of our patients do get a sleep study about three months after surgery. And we, we recommend that heavily because it's important to, to see that it's working well and to see that it's benefiting patients. And so then we get a post-operative AHI on that sleep study. And that's where we have been really, we've been really happy that we're seeing a 90% reduction in the AHI on average. And so that is bringing people from that moderate to severe range down into the normal range quite often, or even at least into the mild, low mild sleep apnea where they do get benefit. And so I gotta tell you that I, I have been pretty excited over the years with that because even before we started doing this three years ago and we thought this is gonna be great, I didn't think we'd be getting that good of results. And we're really happy and we're really proud of the program actually. And, and, um, and we're, we're really seeing the significant reductions more than I would have anticipated. And the patient satisfaction has been, has been awesome. Um, so we're, we're really happy about that. I hope that answers that question. Um, I have one more question here. Um, if the implant doesn't happen to work, does insurance cover taking it back out? That's, I, I don't know. That's a good question too. I, I would think they would. Um, we haven't, that's a possibility as I understand it with these implants to take them out. Um, and it's been done in other uh, medical centers, as I understand it, um, we haven't had to do that yet. And so I think that, uh, I, and as we do more and more over years and years, that may have to happen at some point. But um, I would tell you that that's kind of also a testament, I think, to, I, I feel like that that's a testament to how, how good of a treatment option this is. And that's something that I anticipated too, before we did this three years ago, that we might have to take some of these out if they just didn't work and would that be difficult and, and that'd be frustrating to patients. But man, we've been doing this three years now and we haven't had to take any, but any out yet. And we've done well over a hundred. And on average, we're seeing a 90% reduction in the apnea hypopnea index. And we're seeing 94% patients, percent, uh, patient satisfaction, but that's not a hundred percent. And so there are some people who get less than average improvement 
But even those people are still getting some improvement, maybe not as much as we want, and maybe they're not getting um, way down to, towards that normal range of apnea hypopnea index, but they're still getting some benefit and they're still using it. And so even the patients who get kind of mediocre results, they're still using it. Um, they're still getting some benefit. And we work with those people too. Um, Dr. Lee, uh, the sleep medicine provider we work with, um, has been specially trained in, in reprogramming the device to really try and find optimal settings. And so there are things that can be done for patients if they don't get the immediate um, optimal result. And so we haven't taken any out yet, but, and, and so I, it doesn't worry me as much as it used to, like, what are we gonna do if this doesn't work and we have to take them out? But it may have to happen at some point for some un unlucky individual. I, I haven't done it yet, so I'm not quite sure about the insurance implications of that. Okay, I think uh, that that is all the questions that I see in the chat box, but um, is there anything else that you wanna say in conclusion, Dr. Detmer? No, I think I, I forgot to mention that um, there's two of us here in Mason City who do the surgery. Um, I'm one of them, and then Dr. Dan Lee joined us last summer, and he also does these surgeries. And then Dr. Phil Lee, who is Dan's father, is a sleep medicine provider who works with us too, and. Um, and uh, helps with the pro the uh, the activation of the device and and the follow up afterwards and any programming changes that need to be done with the device after surgery. So there's three of us kind of involved in this program. And um, if you call to make an appointment, you could see any three of us. That's the only thing I forgot to mention early on. Okay. That's good. If you feel like you are um, you know could be a candidate, I think the best thing to do is to make an appointment with Dr. Detmer or Dr. Lee, and the phone number is 641-494-5380. Um, and that's it. So we will stay in touch with you. And um, thank you so much for attending the seminar. And thank you, Dr. Detmer. Yeah, thank you everybody for your time. I hope you have a good evening.